We're talking late 70s over to early 80s, a crucial period actually for computers in many regards, yes. There was definitely a British's best, Britain first, purchasing policy, either for government institutions like radar establishments, like the police, all this kind of stuff, and particularly for educational uh, establishments. The feeling was computers are expensive, so if we're going to spend a lot of money, it might as well be fed back into the British economy by buying British. Certainly applied to universities. One or two were allowed to escape. I think the University of Newcastle on the computer science front was allowed to have an IBM. So, of course, was the University of Cambridge. Can't remember what happened at Oxford. It was a way for me to find out by the back door about the advantages, in a way, of sharing a hardware platform with not just other universities, but other government institutions. And in the, one of the previous videos, I've talked about how we only felt able to use Algol 68 as a teaching language because that well-known government institution, bless them, the Royal Radar Establishment, had actually put a huge amount of effort into setting up a very good Algol 68 compiler. And of course it had to be on ICL machinery. They were a government establishment. So were we. So we benefited from that a lot. Well, how did you get into Unix? You went over to the States, didn't you? Can you tell me about that? Yes, I, I, it's true. Uh, I went over to the States in 1978 for the whole calendar year and visited in short order, and it was all highly educational. A visit to Oklahoma State University, where they'd written an Algol 68 compiler, so given my interest in those days, that was a no-brainer. But I then thought, no, no, if I'm going to be away for a year, I want the California <laughs> experience. And so I finagled my way into doing some teaching at UCLA, of course, in Los Angeles, but also in the Cal State system. Cal State Northridge is a well-known California State thing. And I did, I lectured all sorts of computer things there, taught Fortran in Oklahoma and so on. It was weird actually, that in some ways at Nottingham we were a little bit ahead of the curve there because before I left, we'd taken our first tentative steps into getting this thing called Unix, which enabled you on a underpowered PDP-11 to sort of run your own programming experience, multi-user, but only on dumb terminals, yeah. A multi-user, multitasking operating system, hopelessly underpowered machinery, but it sort of worked. And this was, must have been about 76 when we bought, um, first of all, the PDP 1105, just to get used to having our own computer of some sort, could do assembler programming. But I think just more or less as I got in the plane from America, uh, my colleagues told me that, no, we're going to get that upgraded to a PDP 1135 as quickly as possible, and that when we do, we will be ready to receive this operating system called Unix, done by Bell Labs. And people said to me, Dave, you'll find, just like why did a radar establishment have to support your compiler, you'll now be saying, why does a telephone company have to be the people that provides me with a little operating system that I feel happy with? And uh, it, was, it, it was, as Yogi Berra once said, like deja vu all over again. Oklahoma State was saying, wow, you know, you're ahead of us, we want to go to Unix, we can't get approval, all this kind of stuff. So when I came back, uh, 1979, very cold winter, all that, it really was a liberation to know that while we might have to rely on the computing center for a lot of bulk teaching and running programs, nevertheless, we could start to do our own thing on PDP-11s with an eye to the future. But even so, we couldn't, on a PDP-1135, give a bulk service to our CompSci undergrads. We continued running Algol 68 on ICL machinery with a huge extended overlap with us getting Unix because we couldn't become self-hosting on Unix or have enough big powerful machines until well after this era. We were made very aware that we were getting this for a few hundred dollars because it came from Bell Labs. Bell Labs was a so-called regulated monopoly and that meant they were caught in the crossfire from everywhere. 
they must not be seen to be using their massive leverage and obscene telephone bills to squash little startup telcos. They must not get in the way of IBM because there was a suspicion that, you know, when people said to Bell Labs, well, what are you doing for the public good? They thought it was a nice, cool idea to say, look, we've got basically a computer science research department. We're not a computer company, but these researchers. It really was a bit like Morven's radar defence establishment. We are not a computing company, absolutely not. But we have developed some software that universities might find interesting. So we're proposing for the public good to virtually give away this software, if anybody's interested. And it, it's a start, and IBM won't see it as a threat. Uh, so we're all right. You can get hold of this so long as you are a bona fide degree-giving institution. You can get hold of this Unix. You must have, of course, a PDP-11. Got to keep America's balance of payments in the black. And it must be at least a PDP-1135, not the most minimal you could get. If you do that, this Unix will get you started in the great world of multi-user on simple terminals. You can do your own thing. You'll run out of steam after about four or five users, but nevertheless, it's all yours. So we cheerfully signed up for this. And this, as I say, it was back in 1979. It's all about to happen. Version 7 of Unix. I think we did somehow get hold of the previous one, version 6. But serious usage started with version 7. To find out more about this version 7 that we were getting, how did you find out? Let me be boring and oldie and say yet again, there was no internet. There were no web pages to tell you about this. There was not even email. You had to send out posters to departments. You had to use letters. You could send faxes, right? And you had to say, we are the UK Unix user group principally populated by representatives from computer science departments in UK universities. We all, almost all of us, absolutely long to have Unix. We have persuaded the American master Unix user group and AT&T, the ultimate owners of Bell Labs who ran all the patents and licensing, they're going to come over and tell us how to get licensed for an academic use only, licensed for Unix, and What's it all about? And it was a superb chat shop and ideas, swap shop as it were. Enjoyed it hugely. The star of the show was a visitor from at and Patents and Licensing, Frank J. Riffle Jr. I remember his name. And uh, oh boy, did he have the job from hell trying to keep everybody happy. And he said, I want to license you all. You're wonderful, you know. Uh, we love universities. and." I'm in charge of patents and licensing, but I got to warn you, you must not do any commercial usage with this. It is purely for degree giving teaching only, right? And he kept on muttering to himself, there were a lot of gray areas and it's my job to stamp them out and what a heck of a job it was. He said, just remember, you must be a bona fide degree giving university institution, then you will be licensed, no others. A hand goes up from the audience, a guy, I got to know quite well later on, but he really was the odd man out. Han goes up and said, well, how about me? You've licensed me for version six, but I'm not at a university. Where are you from, sir? And he said, Marcus Gray, this guy's name was. He said, I'm, I'm, I'm just a college. I'm pre-university, you know, from basically we concentrate from 11 to 18. Uh, I'm Marlborough College. I'm a public school. Now, I think even the Americans know that there's nothing more <laughs> badly named than an English public school. It is not available to the poor and the needy as it probably should be or was originally. No, some public schools are so expensive you need serious money to attend them. Principally Eton is the most famous. But Marlborough College isn't far behind. I mean, the tuition fees at Marlborough College will make your eyes water. So this guy said, no, no, I'm not. I'm pre-university, I'm Marlborough College. But sir, over here, you know, most collegers are like universities. And Marcus said, no, it's not the case with me. And Riffle was getting more and more ruffled, if that's a joke, and said, 
Sir, let me try and summarize. Are you trying to tell me that you are more or less a very expensive version of what I would call a high school? And Marcus said, sort of man said, yeah, that's roughly right. He just looked at Marcus and said, sir, you should not have been licensed. <laughs> and he didn't say it, but in parentheses, I could hear it going on in the background. Oh boy, somebody's going to be in deep trouble when I get back to uh, Murray Hill, New Jersey. He said, sir, you should not have been licensed, but Frank J. Riffle is a man of his word. I will not take your license away, sir. Truly, it did change everything. And I do remember very well, we had a lot of conversations at the UK Units Group saying, those guys at Bell Labs are just so good. The two of them, obviously, Dennis and Ken, we've talked about them many a time. They've invented the C language for system implementation. They've developed Unix and it does things sensibly and this is absolutely great. Aren't we lucky, I thought, as a community, to have them being on our side? And I did think, I wonder if they'll ever get any recognition from the ACM, shall we say, about what they've done. And I was very pleased. It took till 1983, I think. But eventually, so many academics in the US and all over the world were using Unix that Dennis and Ken were given the ACM Turing Award. It was actually awarded to them in 84. It was won and achieved in 83. So in 1984, they had to give a talk about what their work meant. And normally, when you write a paper to go with your presentation, you thank everybody, which he did, but then you go on to say, here's how units came about, here's the nuts and bolts of what it's like to really run it. We didn't get that at all. We got thank yous from Ken in cryptic terms, but very heartfelt to a lot of people. So he said, I now just want to point out something to you. Effectively, you've got something here where we use C as a system programming language. So the operating system is written in a high level language. Have you any idea the problems that is going to open up to you? The potential flaws, security holes. Let me just demonstrate one of these to you. You'll be amazed and amused. And I mean, you know what standards we have on computer file. We don't swear. So I'll allow myself to say that one of the uh, rather celebrated people that we're going to point you at in the next video, just described Ken's contribution as a total effing bombshell. And he wasn't wrong. A lot of people couldn't understand why it was a bombshell, but it really, really is. And I'd like to do my best to explain to you just how, what a fundamental earthquake this caused once people understood what he was trying to say. A few seconds or half a second of time, then give him a half, and then give her a little bit, and just go round and round the people who wanted to do some kind of computing. And because computers were even the signal is moving in. So the speed of those pulses tell us the rate. We know which direction it is because we know which roller it's coming from, and we can look at those.